<laughs> well, I think that if I had known exactly how much was going to go into this magazine and knowing the feeling that you have when it, something does become your baby and you're pedantic about colour, you know, you don't realise all of the background work that happens. Welcome to Process the Podcast. I'm your host, Ariel Thomas, motion director, social strategist, and founder of production company Cinematom. I can't wait to bring you into the world of some of my guests, Australia's, and most recently, the world's, thanks to last week's episode with Manuka Sunday, founder Mel Smiley, the creme de la creme of the world working in fashion, media, and design as we unpack their unique creative process. If you love this episode, please hit subscribe or send it to a friend to make it all that little bit less lonely in the wild west of creativity. Or DM me, because I want to know if you love it and I want to know that you exist. So let's dive in. Zoe Davidson, you and I have never met, but we've been on the little Riverside preview having a chat for like 10 minutes and I already love you. (laughs) So I followed Auto Magazine on Instagram about six months ago, I think. And it's, ah, I just love that it. That was so, you. <laughs> <laughs> so talk me through Automag and Auto Productions. Tell me about you. Give me the elevator pitch and then, of course, like we'll dive in. Okay. Um, I'm really bad at elevator pitches, but I'll try. Okay. Um, basically, I feel like they both sort of stem from the same values, I guess. Um, Auto Magazine is, oh, I have a copy here actually, but it's like a biannual print Bible um, and it's, focusing more on a new way of doing creative and the new wave of creative as opposed to focusing solely just on the new wave of creatives, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that I've always been a firm believer that I love my friends and I love what we do and I love um, the newness of that and the ingenuity, but I think that uh, experience speaks for itself and really helps the situation, especially on set, and I think that sometimes... Everyone can take their ideas in a direction, but that level of experience, especially from, I find, photographers, um, mm-hmm. is really great to execute the final plan and for it to go to plan. Uh, lighting references, not someone who knows how to light, well-trained. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of the time a reason why they have 30 years' experience. Yes. And it's birthed from curiosity and accepting, you know, new people into their life and collaborating in that way. So I'm not afraid of the established creative model either. Um, And that's really, I think, evident in the magazine because we did use a lot of the talent from uh, auto productions, but also outsourcing new creatives to work with as well. Um, And auto productions is actually now merged with Loser Kid and it's called Made In. Um, so that launched two weeks ago, which has been amazing and it feels already like maybe a year ago. <laughs> I have a million questions. So which came first, <laughs> Auto Productions or Auto Mag? Um, I was insane and started them both at the same time. <laughs> was it always part of the business plan to be like, I'm going to start a production company and then the actual execution of work gets a, new, gets a forever life being printed? Yeah, I think um, there was a little bit of that and it was part of a business plan, but there was also a lot of me being in a position where I was producing and I was a booker and -hmm. I was really just working for creative talent and going, great, are we happy with those rates? Yep, great, negotiate, speak to clients. Um, And there was no real creative production or creative outlet in that space. Um, So that for me was very much like I need this in order to do, no pun intended, um, (laughs) in order to do. (laughs) I wouldn't make that joke, I swear. Um, But, yeah, in order to do the job that I do, I think I have to have that outlet and have to be introduced to new um, opportunities and people and brands, you know. Yes, I totally get that. So where in your career did you come from? How did you get into producing? Um, I started in PR, which I don't even know how I thought that was for me, Um, (laughs) (laughs) which is funny because I guess what I do now is like PR for people. Um, But yes, I can't sell something that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was difficult for me. And then I spent a lot of time trying to find myself after that um, and kind of just picking up 
little gigs here and there. Like I always was never afraid to work for free. Yeah. Um, it was always like I knew that I never wanted to go to uni. I never wanted to study. It just wasn't how my brain worked. Mm -hmm. And the only way I could learn was being on the ground and learning in situations that require yeah. lateral thinking or industry specific thinking. Um, and then I worked for a model agent for a while. I did uh, a little bit of creative talent. And then my previous role before this was creative talent. And then I kind of begged for production, which I don't know why I think I wanted a death wish. <laughs> Yes. Amazing. So now you're, so Ben J who has loser kid. Yes. How did it come about that you guys joined forces? Uh, through lockdown, like any great online relationship, um, we met through EDMs. I think we were both checking out each other's work and we were like, Oh, I love what you're doing. Um, and we just started talking and we both had really similar business plans. He had a magazine as part of his structure as well. Um, we'd been running for a similar length of time, but he was more um, commercially based and kind of did fashion because New Zealand was such a small market. And I mm -hmm. think that's where his heart lies. Um, but he's a director and an EP yes. as it stands. So um, that was definitely his direction and I am definitely the fashion brain of us two um mm -hmm. so finally we kind of just realized we got along we live together now when he's in town um I love <laughs> this yeah it was it just kind of happened really it made sense so uh, is loser kid and order productions kind of no more it, they're both going to be called made in yes so we now have a new website called made in partners or dot partners yes um and loser kid and order exist on that uh but loser kid is predominantly uh directors and yes. focusing in tvc world and feature link film and uh order is fashion photographers and stylists and hair and makeup artists okay this is so yeah. cool so <laughs> the plot my, begins. <laughs> yeah so my entire career since i've as a director, I've always been told, follow what Ben J's doing, follow what Ben J's doing. Really? So, yes. Yeah, so when he like popped up in our email thread, I, I was like, hang on, how does he fit into this puzzle? Because I guess it hadn't, you guys hadn't actually synced, like the website wasn't live and the information no. wasn't live yet. I thought that Zoe was still order and order only. And I was like, where the hell does Ben J come into this? But I, love I think that now I also I accidentally put him in, I think I was supposed to forward it to him yes. it was like peak us see, developing see the websites and I just <laughs> see, see him in and he's like babe what is this I was like oh yeah this <laughs> um I'm a podcast don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> okay amazing oh, that's amazing so that's so nice it, to know so yeah he's incredible and his work is so well respected so yeah how is the I guess the hop across the pond working because you rep a lot of New Zealand artists and he's obviously over in New Zealand. We started merging earlier than we actually did. So okay. both of us uh, believed, and I think this is another element that drew us together, but we both believed that it was really odd that creative talent didn't have like a mother agency system. Yes. Um, like models do. <laughs> um, and so we, that was kind of what we were working away on in the background. Um, and then pre-merging. So I took on a lot of his artists that were coming to town or had been in town or wanted to break into the Sydney market yep. and vice versa. Right. Okay. Yes. I love so this. That was that. But now we've just managed everyone um, kind of as local talent in both places. Um right that seems to work well and everyone's like a little family so they like get kind of excited to see each other yeah of course I, the community that um production companies and representation agencies can create is so important i think because it can be so isolating being an artist it's lonely as hell <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i think that they i think maybe not enough people are fostering yeah. that family environment and kind of using each other to support one another yeah. um which is a large premise of what Maiden is about it's obviously we love our artists and want them to develop together but 
it's not exclusively just our artists working together. We want them to branch out. Yeah, absolutely. So who else is in your team? Um, for Made In, we've got Ben J, myself, Anna, Anouk and Namiko at the moment. Uh-huh. And we are actually hiring someone else. So that would be great. Anyone can email me if uh-huh. they want to so, join. So what are their roles? Have you got uh-huh. a production kind of assistants and coordinators? Yeah. So Anouk and Anna manage the glam squad, um, mm-hmm. and pick up some of the styling pieces as well. And then... Ben J looks after the directors and I look after the photographers as it stands. That's really cool. Yeah. And very well segmented, I think. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good because it's not like your New Zealand people, my Australian people. Yes. It's very much like everyone is our people. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. So <laughs> Order Magazine, where is that kind of sitting at the moment in terms of the Australian industry? Because it comes out twice a year, you said? Yes. I've ordered my copy. Yeah. It hasn't arrived yet. I'm very... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Where's my order? No. <laughs> Literally. Um, oh no, so... It's so fun. No, so we have had the most interesting um, delivery journey and production journey on that with a really tight turnaround for actually producing all of the content. Yeah. Um, so that I'm just not even going to go into because it's... Um, fresh wound um but it's it's coming your order is coming um but we in the Australian market I think that I noticed a really big gap for a really long time and I don't think it was as evident maybe 10 years ago but especially after COVID it just felt like we didn't have a lot of opportunities to share our visual voice or even just our voice Mm. um as a creative industry um And we just, I think that it was really birthed from not needing to be an overseas publication. Like we are in Australia, there are amazing creatives in Australia. Yes. We do, if you come in with the mindset that, oh, I'll just do everything I need to do in my life when I go overseas, I think it can be even more isolating for you Mm. here. Um, And you don't get to see the wonderful, amazing creatives that we do have here. So In the industry, I feel like it's definitely a cultural magazine as opposed to being strictly fashion or strictly arts um, or the arts. But I think it really sits on its own. And I know that sounds so niche, but I just don't think that we have like a hardcover coffee table book that you can go back and continue to pick up a million times and find something Mm. new and different and interesting that stays relevant beyond its like three month to six month lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely (laughs) agree. So (laughs) we don't and it's sad. Like print. Yeah. Like it seems like we're opening up. I don't know what trades you open and what kind of industry trades and advertising world trades you subscribe to, but it seems like print mags are shutting down monthly and it's so sad. So it's coffee table books like, like, Presenting a coffee table book magazine style is just, so, first of all, very clever because it, there's a huge white space in the market for that. Like it's, it is a niche and yeah. you just executed it in a beautiful way, but <laughs> yeah, you. it doesn't exist. I think it's really cool. I'm very excited to get my issue. I will say. Amazing. Well, you can have this one now. <laughs> I can't wait. But I tried to get it before this interview and I was like, I'm going to be so organised. The dates are going to line up. And then I was like, oh, fuck, it hasn't arrived. But anyway, but you're busy. You're busy merging businesses. It's oh, fine. I get it. I get it. Yes. <laughs> so you've said that the, the magazine is not strictly your talent. I think a lot of agencies would probably have the mindset of creating a magazine that is strictly their talent. So what's your process basically in bringing this magazine to life? That's a huge task. Yeah, it was, um, I think it was really blissfully naive. I think that I'm so (laughs) glad. No, and I don't read that in a bad way. All those things are. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think that if I had known exactly how much was going to go into this magazine and knowing the feeling that you have when something does become your baby Mm. and you're pedantic about color and you're like you know you don't realize all of the background work that happens um but I think for me the artist can't be pushed into any new way of doing things without working with other creatives and like 
as I said, we love them working together and they are like a family and they do form really strong creative bonds. But um, I think you always have to look outside your circle Mm -hmm. and that's probably one of the really enjoyable moments that we had, which was like finding a photographer that one of the stylists just found they completely bonded or didn't expect to make such beautiful imagery and then they had this really amazing ebb and flow on the day. Um, I think we made a lot of incredible friendships as well that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But Michelle Gray, who was actually the wife or is the wife of an artist I used to represent um, and is amazing in her own right, she brought in a lot of the cultural element. She started Arts Matter here Mm -hmm. Um, and her experience in New York and I think she also worked on the first issue of Yen magazine right? um, when that first started. So she's culturally, she has her finger on the poles. She's really great. And um, she found a lot of the talent in here that were, has her name attached to it actually as well. Um, and then my beautiful friend Tamsin did a lot of the writing and um, interviewing of the talent. And she also sourced some of her own talent to add um to the mix Mm -hmm. but we focused on one overarching question which all of the interviewees sort of answered Mm -hmm. um, instead of asking a million questions about them necessarily. (laughs) Yeah that's definitely what has come from starting this podcast. I have found all the magazine kind of guests have always stuck to a theme. I mean like Rush has always had themes and Vogue, my first ever episode was with Pip Moroni, who was at the time the senior fashion editor at Vogue. She very clearly broke down that every episode has a theme and it's it's a response to something that's happening culturally, which you know as a consumer you're kind of like, this has a theme, but to hear it but to hear it said is like, oh no shit, like that was your workflow. You didn't just get up one morning and have like cue cards out and you were like, this is cool and like figure out the page numbers. Like yeah it's a incredible feat I think to respond to something so what was the question that everybody in the issue well our theme was stream of consciousness and um that was also because I was terrified I wouldn't be able to find anyone to write so I was like if I'm having to write all of this (laughs) at least stream of consciousness I can't be slammed for bad grammar or punctuation um love that but also safety net (laughs) so good (laughs) but the funniest part was that it actually ended up becoming my stream of consciousness. Like every shoot that we started doing the creative for, um, like I would start with an initial idea or Aubrey or Emma would come to me with an initial bare bones idea. And it did really become my stream of consciousness, which was weird. And I noticed that as I was going throughout like six months in, I'm like, that was my stream of consciousness. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Oh, the theme has presented yeah. itself here. <laughs> yes. So good. Um, but the overarching question was actually what, basically what do they think and what do these artists think set them apart from their peers? Because we were right. table discussion, kind of think tanking, what sets some designers, like, you know, those really amazing designers that you see on Instagram and they've got, like, my friend um, Alex Higgins is a great example. He shoots everything on his living room f- living room floor. It's carpeted and we laugh about how hideous it is, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> and he's so himself on Instagram and we're kind of breaking all of that down. And then Grimes wore his outfits. Um, Hunter Schaefer bought like five pieces and actually purchased them. Like yeah. he just created this cult kind of following from a really simple idea, which I think was being himself. But we sort of wanted to break that down between every artist and what made them special. Yeah, that's a very unique way to approach and hero them. It's beautiful to see that. Another reason why I'm very excited to get the issue. (laughs) So, So what were the challenges launching a tangible magazine? I think the challenges... It being the first magazine and not having anything um, physical or tangible to show people yes. is always really hard. Uh, we started with an online presence, but that was really a sounding board 
for testing what stuck and what didn't. And obviously that's mm-hmm. different from print to online. Um, so that was the first hurdle was finding creatives that wanted to work with someone they didn't know essentially mm-hmm. or hadn't had many dealings with. Um, but I think that every magazine would face the same issues and it's opting for like pulling down creative ideas or toning them down to suit your budget when Mm. you spend your entire life doing that in your everyday client-based working relationships (laughs) that like when you have a magazine you're like I just want everything (laughs) yeah totally yeah Um, (laughs) so that was I think it's always going to be towing the line as well between do you feel like you're selling out by partnering with a million different brands um, Mm. or advertisers in general? Um, And I think we, I really wanted to maintain integrity on that front just for the first issue. I feel like it needed to be a clean slate. Um, And so Celine for one cover was the only partnership that we actually did. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I'm glad that we made that decision in retrospect because it does feel like the per- perfect place to start. Yeah. Um, and I think that was actually really challenging because you want to take money. You're like, okay, great. That's, yeah. we do, you know. Um, but in terms of the artist's inside and what it's going to evolve into, um, I think I wanted to let that happen more naturally. How did you go getting Celine to sign on to something that didn't that wasn't tangible yet? Was that did it help having the names of your, for example, consult the consultant kind of position that had been at Yen? Like, was it contact driven? Yeah, I think that it all helped. I think relationships are always key. Like, mm. that's the biggest thing I found was when you find your people in the industry, mm. then you all. And they know that you're passionate. I think above all passions, just people can see that. Mm. Um, and they kind of know that you're not going to let it fail. Um, yes. I think that's probably the most key locally. Overseas, it's really hard to convince people <laughs> that, like, yeah. you're amazing <laughs> or that it all is going to be amazing. I'm yeah. like, I don't want to sell myself or sell, you know, yeah. I've got the best publication or, you know, yeah. it just sounded weird. But um I think it all helped and I think the creatives involved helped that when they could see what the photographer and their work looked like and then they could see the creative brief, um, I think it all came together in their mind. Yeah. What did you have to present to them, like, as far as that goes? A creative brief that we went back and forth on a little bit Mm -hmm. um, to match how they saw that particular piece sitting in the world and then we'd already spoken with the company a lot in the beginning like when Mm. the idea first came to be um they really championed us which was really nice um and we met with them and we went in and we did appointments and just fostered the relationships I think yeah wow it's very admirable so where (laughs) do you think that order is going to go if it's bi-annually when's the next one dropping September. So how far are you into development of that? We're into the pre-production. Um, the last one only actually took a month to produce all of the content. Right. So I think going back to your initial question, printing, we printed overseas um, mm-hmm. in Singapore, which was the colours, the quality is great. Yeah. Um, but the actual process itself was really hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, And expensive. But at the time when we first were in negotiations, everything was quite cheap because it was post-COVID. Maybe they were willing to drop prices a little bit. The price of paper was better, a million different things. Um, But that was really hard, especially being a bit of a control freak. It was like, I can't see every page. I'm going to go crazy, Um, which is why I ended up going over. (laughs) Oh, really? Did you go to just supervise? I went for all of the pre-press because we basically couldn't get anywhere for a really long time without me being able to see it. I realized the iPhone um, makes everything orange. 
Yes, it does change colours, yes. (laughs) Um, So I'm like, the skin, this, that was all wrong. But I'm really glad that I went over. It was an amazing experience and seeing what they've created with their other um, clients was actually wild and I wanted to change so many things about the magazine after it seeing it because I was saw, so inspired. And you were like, oh, wow, you can do that? Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. What is the process? Can you kind of share the process of pre-press like you just mentioned? Yeah. Well, ours was very um, drawn out, but pre-press was basically getting all of the files to them once all of that was done and the colours look good on our end. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went in... It was like a four-day intensive pre-press boot camp. Um, and you gotta, wow. I went in and they had, um, I don't know any of the technical terms for this, but they had like all of the CMYK um, transfer um, on like aluminium. Um, so oh. that was like the first step. I've got pictures which I can send you, but it was wow. really cool. Yeah. And then... Um, they basically just started printing once I was happy with everything digitally, although I did try to make a joke about um, one of the ladies wanting to hit me over the head and give me paper cuts with the paper by the end of it because I'm like, change it again. <laughs> um, but no, so then they, we just started doing different versions of colour. It was really interesting because it was like 20% more magenta and then that would affect something else and then you've got uh, every sheet has four pieces of uh, four different pictures on it, sorry, and it's cut into four different right parts. Yeah. Um, so that was like sometimes sacrificing one image for another um, or for another story, which was hard. You're like, oh, no. Um, wow. Yeah. But then they have like all these little setups. Then it just went into like, okay, you'd sign off, you'd keep printing until you got the colour right, sign off. And that just went on for like four days. Like it was long and by the end I think some pictures I'm like yeah whatever just that looks great um but I went straight from the final day of that to the airport and I'm like it's okay I can be late she's like no you can't be late you've really got to go so hands on yeah I think it was good though like just to learn the process yeah definitely are you going to continue to print in Singapore um we will see but we are thinking about moving um to new zealand so that it's not as far away and the shipping's a bit easier Mm. and that ben jay and i can both print our magazines at the same time to be a bit more cost effective i guess yeah absolutely so when you say you're in pre-production for it now does that mean that you basically pre-produce everything in bulk then you shoot everything in bulk and then you go into post for everything in bulk yeah that's the easiest way I find it, I yeah. guess, um, because then once the briefs are there, at least it's just like a very rough framework, then everyone can kind of add. Like we just work off Google Slides for everything creative yeah. wise So it is very collaborative. I do like to have a really intense treatment for every shoot mm-hmm. Um just because a lot of the time we are time poor, even though I mm-hmm. for every shoot I did allocate two days um, just to bring back a little bit of like not shooting 150 pictures in a day feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so then I have kind of run all of that by the art director as well mm-hmm. on this issue who's amazing. He's 25. He worked with... Katie Grant at Love Magazine and wow. has just kind of taken life by the balls. Um, <laughs> is he Australian? Yeah, he's from Adelaide. I'm like, I knew it when I met him. I said, I was like, I knew you were from Adelaide because you're so nice. So you've got your creative directing the magazine and then you've got an art director assigned to each issue. And then yes. who else kind of joins forces to help you bring all this to life? So... Emma Reed and Aubrey Smith were my fashion team last year. Mm-hmm. Um, Emma's also an amazing copywriter, so that's very helpful, and she um, checked a majority of the magazine, which is very nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Anna helped a lot with the production last time, but this issue we will be getting a production manager onto that because mm-hmm. I think that there actually aren't enough hours in the day, and I yeah. have to realise that. Um 
But yeah, and then we've got um, a beautiful woman doing our PR, but I don't know if I can say her name yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's had a lot of experience with luxury fashion and kind of selling items that mean something and have a lot of intent behind them. So um, our team's a little bit bigger this time around, which is a relief. And it's nice to have a really supportive network where everyone's not kind of going mad over deadlines. Yeah. Like last time was literally a month to do everything. So so how we got there. How close up to the wire do you go with print? If you said it's got a, it's coming out September, when do you go to print? We would go six weeks before the 15th of September. So Okay, right. Yeah. So pretty but much the production August of it's first. easy. Yes. Yeah. I the mean, production yeah. of you do yeah. that in your sleep. Yeah. <laughs> that's the like okay we've got this part it's the retouching and following people up like that's what takes time yeah I can imagine um (laughs) I also received an EDM from you after I started emailing you and I just assumed that I maybe I signed up I subscribed or something like that when I was first doing my little looky loo and there was something in there about fashion week yes we it started last year. Um, I really don't take on Fashion Week production, um, but I do for friends. Uh, right. And Alex approached me last year and asked, and it was a great team and it was really fun and he's so lovely and relaxed that mm-hmm. everything just feels very easy, yeah. um, which isn't the case for, I don't think, many other shows. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, but yeah, so we did that last year. And it was amazing. It was lots of fun. Um, we all had a great time. And then this year, uh, Tamsin has just started her own uh, sales agency called mm-hmm. KCP Collective. Cool. Um, and she basically looks after every amazing emerging designer you can think of. Um, and I really support her, but also the fact that she supports emerging artists. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, um, amazing thing to get up in the morning to do. Yeah, and I think she's actually the only, and I, I know this sounds bold, but I'm pretty sure she's one of the only agencies in the world that does it because everyone needs their money-making machine. Yeah. And usually the emerging designers are just like, We really want them, but we know we won't make a lot of money off them for the first few years. Yeah, they need a cash cow or something, but she's sticking to her guns. Wow. Yeah. Um, So I'm helping her with her designers as well, um, which has been great. I mean, she's a friend, so everything with her is fun and enriching, and we stem into like 25 other ideas while we're doing the one thing. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> Can I just say? That's a lot of bouncing. The afternoon light is hitting you <laughs> so well right now. <laughs> I'll put the little clip on Instagram so people can see. Whoa, girl. Thank you. <laughs> you look amazed. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I didn't have my blinds down. <laughs> Killing it. How will the trends and stuff that come from um, Afterpay inform your awareness of trends and all of that I guess my question is where do you seek inspiration from and is it from Australian Fashion Week at all uh I would say that it's never really been trend based I think um everything that I've done and sometimes to my own fault um has been very intuitively led Mm -hmm. if I feel good about something or something sits right then it's usually a go Mm -hmm. (laughs) um And I think that's the same thing, like with, it was really hard to describe to people what the magazine was going to be Mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't like, I only want this style of photographer or I only want this kind of artist. It was, I think the brief that I gave everyone was like, I don't know what it is because when I see it, I'll know. (laughs) Yes, one of them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And everyone was like, that's amazing, but we don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, cool. But you Um, got there in the end, obviously. Yeah, well, in the end, I think a lot of people just learn to just trust. They're like, I know you've got it somewhere in your head. So if you say that we're going to do this, 
then let's roll with it because I know that there's something else bubbling yeah. away that you're not informing us on right now for whatever reason. Um, so I think, yeah, trend wise, I think it comes from so many different places, like a lot of film, a lot of, um, I think poetry, like this issue, we had Emma Balfour's uh, excerpts from her book that mm-hmm. Doing Bird published, like, I don't even, 2001, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really inspired me throughout life. Like she, the poetry was amazing. She's a, an incredible writer. It was really relatable. And I think that also fit in well with the stream of consciousness um, overarching theme Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah I don't think it's trend-based I think it's very much influenced by who I'm around and what I'm looking at so I feel like I do have to be looking at good things interesting things a lot yeah it takes a lot out of you do you get overstimulated ever all the time (laughs) (laughs) help me (laughs) no like in a weird way I kind of love it yeah like I kind of, I don't know. I've always said if I'm not frantic, I'm bored. One million percent. I totally <laughs> agree. Yes. <laughs> Which I think people like you obviously understand, whereas other people just think, look at you, like you have three heads. <laughs> You've been in the industry for a while and obviously running your own production company now. How are you seeing deliverables and, and the asks of these shoots changing? I think that motion, which I'm actually really happy about, has taken a huge, like, step forward. Uh, I think that Australia still has quite a way to go. And in terms of globally, I think motion has been pushed for a really long time. Um, And I think we're always, our industry is always reflecting what's happening culturally or social media wise. And like Mm. we were saying before the podcast, um, TikTok or Instagram reels like I kind of feel like everyone looks at life now in yeah. Instagram reels or TikToks um, so I think that's been that's made a big impact on our deliverables but I think that there's always going to be place or a place for stills um, and I think it's kind of pushed a really great divide which I don't actually mind as much I mean A lot of photographers I know hate it, but there's a real divide where it's like quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sorry, quantity over quality. And then there's the other end of the spectrum where it has to have intent and it has to have a different voice and you've got to have like a really strong perspective. And I think that's also kind of nice. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think each, you'll, you'll know what, which clients have which intent like which yes. one, which way they swing and then I guess you act accordingly, right? There's like three questions that I ask and they're my factors as to how much money I think someone has and how many deliverables I think that they need and you kind of know instantly. Mm. Can you share what, what the questions are? Oh, I just sent to. one email this afternoon. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I think that I'll be found out. They're like, no, she's just asking how much money we have. <laughs> Yeah, moving on, sure. So you've got a pretty incredible suite of creatives. What do you look for in your talent? A really, really strong visual voice. That's probably the most important for me. Um, Second to that is a natural curiosity. I think um, if you're not naturally curious, you're probably not going to go as far as your talent will take you. Um, or could take you. Um, I think every great creative wants to know everything about the world Mm -hmm. and they're really open to exploring um, different ideas. I think you've got to have a drive. Um, Otherwise, in this world that we live in, I don't think you can really survive without one. Mm -hmm. Um, But there, and you've got to be nice. Like, (laughs) you've just got to be a good person. (laughs) That's, I can't do, honestly, when... I first started the production company. My um, tagline was like, I just don't want to work with fuckwits, please. Yeah, no dickhead policy for (laughs) sure. (laughs) Have you found that even I've, I've run into this a few times in my own career when you take those cash cow jobs and you're asked to stretch into a certain aesthetic that jeopardizes your visual storytelling and visual voice. 
do you have any advice for creatives that are, I guess, lost or wanting to refine it for the sake of, I think, I think there is success comes when people do, they, they attract their people in the proper yeah. way and the proper sense of the saying when you have a strong visual voice, but yeah. that can get lost quite easily, I think. I think so too, but I think that a really good example actually is um, personal work. I, mm-hmm. I always look at personal work before I look at anything else. And I think that drives a lot of my decision and probably where I mean the visual voice comes out the most. Yeah, right. Um, and when you compare, I actually look after one photographer who on our first meeting, I thought that he was going to ask for me to sign him. And we didn't get there and that I was like, okay. And I was like, you know, I don't love your commercial work. And he was like, thank you so much for your honesty. Like, that's great. Um, But then he showed me his personal work and it was incredible. Like the most beautiful pictures I've seen in a very long time. Um, And then when I was able to put his personal work next to his commercial, commercial work, I could see where it all stemmed from. Mm. And I think that focusing, if you're feeling like you don't really know where you're at or what you're doing or you feel like you've lost your voice, I think going back to just getting your creative tool of choice in your vicinity and using it in a way that you feel like you want to use it is the most important thing for you. Mm. Yeah, definitely. That's a very good way to put it. So how do you as a producer and the creative director how are you juggling all of this personally um i would like to say with great ease no (laughs) (laughs) but i I would be lying i have a vape and yeah yeah. Yeah, i have a vape (laughs) and a packet of cigarettes on my desk Um, (laughs) just for different like varying extremes of stress change it up girl yeah Yeah. well i actually Yeah, my throat is not thanking me. Um, but no, I stopped drinking a little while ago, which really helped. Um, I didn't even tell you that in the beginning, but um, I just felt like I needed to be optimized all the time. Yes. And that I actually couldn't physically or mentally afford to feel like shit. Um, and I noticed a huge difference in everything like I was a much nicer person I people didn't annoy me I didn't have like little outbursts I guess yeah. <laughs> but to yourself where you're just like ah um, yes. <laughs> and I think I wake up early I go to bed now relatively early and I think it's just hard work like I yeah. think that we just learn how to get a lot of shit done in the day <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I've learned recently to get out of my own way a little bit. And I think cutting back on alcohol, I'm not sober by any means. I will definitely have a glass of wine, but I have changed my point of view around parties and social drinking and all that kind of stuff on and knockoff drinks and all those yeah. cult- <laughs> cultural things that we weave into thinking that that's how you bond with people and getting to know people. And even I've been on sets with people all new crews and they're all like, let's go to the pub. And of course you want to be there and be chummy and you want to lead that pack. And, (laughs) and, and you feel like if you do it sober while they're sending it, it kind of changes the tone, but you kind of learn that that's okay. I think it's um, been quite amazing actually how accepted it is now. Like I think um, I've really gotten into new tropic drinks, which I know Mm. it sounds like. What is that? Uh, they're basically, they, they have a lot of non-alcoholic alternative drinks, which are like no gronies or like That's gin and tonics. Yeah. yeah. Oh. The, the guy, he, the guy, Tim, who makes those actually, they're so delicious, but the nootropics basically are supposed to rewire your brain. So not only are you not drinking, but they're supposed to kind of connect the dots that you want connected in your brain um, right. with herbs. And um, I think in the States they do a lot with CBD as well. Um, right. But they're just uh, – Bella did did Kin Euphorix. She released Kin Euphorix, mm-hmm. which was – that's basically nootropics as well. Um, wow. So 
yeah, they're just delicious, like delicious drinks that are good for your brain and make you feel a little bit less like out of place. Right. Kind of like a heaps normal beer, but with brain wiring and like optimization. Yeah, so you're yeah. like biohacking <laughs> at the <Yeah>. pub. <laughs> I love this. This is amazing. Well, it's I think it's honestly and I we laughed about it last night, but I'm I was telling everyone about them. I'm like, this is the way of the future. Um yeah. because we don't have time. Like we're so time poor. And I've had so many amazing memories um with mutual friends like (laughs) that was the whole reason that I felt comfortable enough to go on this podcast was Mm -hmm. through a mutual friend who I loved and we met you know obviously in the same circles but I just don't feel like it has a place in my life right now yeah totally I'm feeling a very similar way I think I think it's quite common a lot of people are which is exciting and I'm glad that we're talking about it because it's not something I've voiced or been in a conversation necessarily about so I'm excited that if anyone else is feeling the same way they can kind of gel with it yeah Um, how are you do you find it challenging to manage your creative brain and your producer's brain and switch between the two I think that I've always had a really healthy balance of both. Yeah. Um, so yes, I do find it hard sometimes when you're really locked into an amazing project creatively and then you're pulled aside from a production point of view mm. into different productions as well or different levels of artist management or different shareholders agreements or tax yeah. meetings or whatever it is. Like accounting is not my um, strong suit. Uh, but I think... Overall, I've always kind of found that works well together in my own brain. Um, And I think that in terms of agency structure, uh, we were actually speaking about this today. Um, I don't think that the agency structure in the sense as we know it works anymore. Like you can't Mm. really just be an agent or a producer within a creative talent management agency or production company Mm -hmm. I think you have to wear many hats and I think what a lot of people don't realize about managing talent is the emotional intelligence that you have to have and the empathy Mm -hmm. um (laughs) which I'm sure you would understand and I get it too like I I feel like I can really gel with exactly what they're feeling at that time but I think that in itself requires both sides of the brain as well um But I do think that women make the best producers. That is a wonderful point. Agreed. Mm. Um, How do you map out your day? Do you literally, can you bounce between the two or do you have to kind of do one brain in the morning and one brain in the afternoon? I kind of do. I'll always get on top of emails like first thing in the morning and at night. Yeah. Otherwise I don't feel, I feel like someone's going to randomly call me and ask me like a really in-depth question and I'm just going to be like, sorry, I haven't caught up or, you know, that freaks me out. Um, (laughs) But no, I just, I bounce. I just, I tried using time tracking and I tried using, um, what's Elon Musk's system? Like blocking, time blocking? Yeah, time blocking. I've tried all of Mm. those and it just doesn't work for me. Mm. It's hard to, to, Mm. especially when you're of the mindset that you want to self-optimize, you're like, but (laughs) there's a way and I can be amazing, but I just haven't figured it out yet. I'm like toggle track. It's like my best friend. And I'm like, it took more time for me to press start and stop on it than it did for me to just like send the email or make the call or like, I felt like that used up enough energy in itself. I feel like those things are best for like call centers and like yeah. who, who, how much time are you spending calling government entities versus the public yeah. system? You know what I mean? Like it's not for us. I would love yeah. someone to come out with all this amazing <laughs> technology like for a creative, but I don't know. I'd love for them to, just to read my mind. Like you need to do this yeah. now. Good. I think good CRM and a good email system helps like, our email system can you can snooze something to remind you later um yeah right okay so that is like they're kind of my little helpful things that I use a lot and calendar iCal if it's not an iCal I don't remember yeah for sure (laughs) a slave to the calendar of course yeah so 
what's next for order mag and then lose a kid and then made in partners <laughs> how are you guys literally merging the two so that it'll be like one entity one bank account your team's yeah. salaries like are you is your team on the payroll no, no, everyone's contractual. Okay, so your um, contractors, is that coming out of the same bank account as Ben J? Like, is it a real, oh, it's I'm so a real excited thing. about this. I know. No, it's a, it's a real thing. Um, I think the goal is for it to be like a super agency that you can take on creative directors and mm-hmm. we have creative directors that we're working with already and just assessing how that relationship works for them as well. Um, but it's it's creative-led. So, like, without our creatives, there is no median. And a lot of the time they do drive the creative brief. Um, mm-hmm. I think we work with a lot of talent that enjoy that process or have learned to enjoy or lie about enjoying it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it, being able to tailor your own brief, I mean, like directors do, um, and bringing that to fashion is yeah. really special and needed because I think we're in terms of deliverables, like you said before, and everything changing in the scope and the landscape of what we do changing. Uh, I do think that when a creative is heavily involved in that process and being able to come up with solutions that match a brief and they have time to do that and get paid to do that. Uh, I think that that solves the time poor agency mindset of Mm -hmm. an ad agency or of, um, a client that maybe does everything in house, but just can't find the time Mm. to really nut out a full creative brief. Yeah. I've only recently started to be asked. I've had clients of course, that just share the brief with me and then I respond to it literally on shoot day and I can ask questions and then I show up and then I basically do what the PDF has told me to do. But then (laughs) recently those clients more when it's content land, not obviously TVC, but yeah. when you're in content land, now it's starting to get a little bit more like what would you bring to this with your expertise? And it feels so good. Yeah, and I think that if you can bring something to it, like our market's pretty saturated in terms of people that do what we do. Like it's very accessible, I think, now to pick up a camera or to pick up um clothes from a shop and style them like you Mm. it's a lot more accessible and I think in that way that voice and that area of expertise and your something that you bring to the shoot is so important and is what sets you apart from all of the people that are your peers yeah definitely um but yes that will evolve I think in the same way that the magazine will and that's pretty organically like I think We have no plans of um, shutting down Auckland or Melbourne or Sydney. Like we want to keep all of our spaces open um, and really be there in those markets. But Mm. I think that Ben J has a pretty similar philosophy, which is like if something isn't working, is that a sign that something needs to change? Um, And we're pretty adaptable like that and you have to be, to be honest. What's, yeah, next for you? Just is it getting the word out? I think, yeah, I think uh, definitely going overseas with the magazine and showing a slice of Australia Mm -hmm. um, and what we can do here. But I think for me, I'm in a really nice space now. Um, I'm happy with where I am, which Mm -hmm. I think we're always thinking about the next thing. And Mm -hmm. it's always like, okay, well, then I've got to do this. And we, I think I already have enough of that in what I do that I'm actually really at peace and happy with where I am. It's very hard to get there. So well done. (laughs) I'm very impressed. I'm proud of you. (laughs) Thank you. I mean, I, you never know how long you're going to stay there, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but for now it feels good. And I, yeah, I think it's just developing and letting everything evolve instead of pushing it, I think is more my focus. Mm. Yeah, the patience and the just being on the tools and doing what you do and letting opportunities and stuff come, it's a hard trait because of hustle culture, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, we are always 
working. And I think that culture is embedded in our industry as well. Mm. Um, but I think that in terms of creating a culture and creating a community and adding value to an industry, I think there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind closed doors. Mm. Um, and that's something that I would like to prioritize. I mean, we have this amazing roster of creatives and everything's about the big dream and like, what can we do with the big dream and having the big ideas and showing people sometimes in baby steps, how the big idea is achievable. Mm. Um, and I think that's the same across the board for everything. Yeah, I guess is that prioritising the journey, not the destination? Yeah, well, I don't know what the destination is. Yeah, I you don't know, know either. Like, it's like, are we ranked? Yeah. Like, are we the top agency yeah. <laughs> or, like, am I the best director? Like, what? I don't know. Yeah. Nor do I, I think... want to be because no. that's, not, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot of pressure. And I'm quite happy with my mood boards and my visualisation board and, yeah. like, having the things that I want on there that maybe – aren't so specific mm. it's I think more it's, of an idea it's defining what success is for you mm. and is yeah. that just having x amount of dollars going into the savings to buy a house or the australian dream or whatever like what <laughs> like can we talk about that like what is success yeah. for you i think there's it's driven mainly by fulfillment like mm. feeling fulfilled is how I kind of measure my success. If I feel like I'm helping or I'm contributing or that we're contributing to something bigger than what's already there, I feel mm -hmm. that that is my idea of success. I've never really been driven by money. I've always believed that money offers you the power and the freedom to do the things that you want to do in your life as opposed yeah. to it sitting in your bank account or like buying a house here i don't know <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> what yeah. do you how do you define a success i'm working that out as we speak i've had very interesting family changes in the past 6 months and there i was raised in a very money oriented environment where the dinner table conversations were profit and loss sheets yeah. <laughs> and that's not who I am and yeah. so in this very recent phase of my life I'm detaching myself from that forging out what I want success to look like but it's a yeah. hard I'm breaking my own foundational mold essentially because yeah and I was also really fortunate because that mindset of wealth and finance and and I guess privilege led me to execute all of my creativity with a fantastic safety net yeah so I'm I've got a two-sided fucking devil and yeah. angel being like what is this journey that we're on bitch like what the fuck yeah. is this and I'm honestly it's like some days I'm muddy as fuck on the on what success looks like and other times I'm not and then yeah. my my family haven't changed their thinking but I have so it's also hard to go home and check in on them and connect because I'm changing as we speak so yeah to be continued I don't know but I'm it's, that's like if I had all the tabs open and I told you my tabs of life, <laughs> that's a very red hot tab that gets clicked on all the time. Because I'm yeah, like, yeah, it's not getting I? closed anytime oh, soon. No, no, yeah, no. I have not <laughs> even touched it. It's just there and it's ready to be worked on and it is being worked on. But I think it's a very very intense work in progress. But then I think that it's also going to change the style of work that I gravitate towards as well. Like I just took on a, a three part breast cancer documentary Amazing. um yeah which is stunning and I'm really excited about it it's super stylized they've approved exactly how I want to shoot it and how I want to connect with talent and they're letting me run the gamut and um congratulations thank you it's really cool but I've never really been in the documentary space I shoot a lot of real people um yeah for brands like Kmart and stuff like that but I don't do the doco take you on a journey make you cry at the end kind of thing yeah. um 
but I can do that and I'm excited to do that. But then again, it's in that philanthropic space and I'm going to be in it for 20 weeks around (laughs) people that are terminally ill. And I think that that will really define how I see success. That will, yeah, I feel like you're in a really um, exciting and like pivotal point. Yeah. I think that experience in itself has obviously presented or that opportunity has presented itself probably at the right time definitely Um, i'm terrified but in like a happy way i'm like oh let's fuck some shit up (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah realign get me (laughs) and then i'll work i'll put all my ducks back in a line after (laughs) yeah i i'm excited for you yeah i'm excited for me too thank you it's it's a time for change for sure but yeah But I also, I totally agree with you on terms of just optimizing the self and getting out of my own way to just be present and do the work. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, I feel like I've done a lot of work and there's some things that needed a lot of fleshing out. Mm. And that was definitely a journey for a long time. Um, but well, it wasn't really that long. I just think of everything as a long time, like yes. over like three years or two years. I'm like, that was ages. <laughs> well, it is a long time. Yeah, it is. It's. I just think that I learned a lot though. And like by going back and revisiting certain things where you're like, oh, I still feel weird about that. I yeah. must have some more to do on that. It's actually, it opens up more and more and more. And then, I don't know, I guess... I don't think you ever stop doing that. Mm, I hope not because this is like where the fun starts to happen. Yeah. And when you surround yourself with the right people that get it, that are also of the same thinking and you can like share the shit and you're like, you know what I was thinking this yeah. and now <laughs> I'm doing this. Like me just yes. sharing that I'm from a privileged background <laughs> and then changes have happened and now I don't really know who I am but I'm doing something with the terminally ill and you're like, yeah, girl, get yeah. it. Like that's huge, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's funny when you see your circle expand or change. Um, a lot of the time it does change based on these, like, I think of, like, um, Nintendos or something where you're, like, getting onto like, a new level and then you're, like, <laughs> jumping. And, like, <laughs> and so I've got a sound in my head. But, like, you acquire these, like, new skills and you acquire, like, more mushrooms or more gold coins or whatever it is. She's like, <laughs> For you, you're like, yes, new level activated. We're on. For sure. I love that. Great. It it is just a game, isn't it? So it makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I think so. A very aesthetically pleasing game because you're bringing out beautiful magazines that I can't wait to receive in the mail. So I can't wait. No, I'm very excited um, to share them. I'm ready. Where's it stocked for people to find about the tangible mag? Where can people go to find that? Only online for this issue on Um, Mm order-mag.com because it's an evolving issue. So we are doing some collaborations with the issue that will be artist collaborations Mm -hmm. um, and that will actually be on the cover, which is also partly why it's got a blank um, cover underneath the jacket. but I really wanted, everyone thought I was crazy, which I probably was, but um, I just wanted full, I wanted to do this journey with issue one kind of on my own Mm -hmm. and not have influences of like, you need to get it in this store, you need to get it in here. I wanted all of the conversations to happen as they happened and when I was pushing that out and when it was the right time as opposed to having someone else kind of just push it on to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's really nice when you're doing it yourself and handing it to someone yourself and showing it to people, you get to see those reactions and you Mm -hmm. get to gauge the response. Um, And I think that sort of helps guide you as to where you want it stopped. Like it's it's definitely more, there's like a list, um, but it's definitely more of a concept store book or yes. a boutique bookstore book. I don't think I would ever news agent it. <laughs> Just the local, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. And if people want to work with you and your artists in a production sense, where can they go? They can go to madein.partners. 
and they can find my email there or they'll probably only be the hello email um but But you could attention zoe you can attention zoe well thank you so much for spending an hour and a bit with me thank you for spending it with me (laughs) i can't wait to see all of this roll out i'm just obsessed with all of it and i love it and i think you are brave and very admirable for optimizing oneself and then just putting out a magazine and doing all the things I can't Thank wait you I'm so Thank excited you. I think you. you're brave for doing a podcast I like that's amazing it's scary but it's really it's fun scary. and I get like totally random people that are listening to this know who they are they just message me being like hey I sent a whole bunch of emails this week because I listened to your podcast and I was really inspired and like that's all I need you know, like so I, that's success. That's yeah. like that's fulfilling. That's yeah. success. It's really nice. So I've got a bunch of people that are listening to it quite regularly and depend on the fuel that we're creatively feeding them because there's not really that much out there in terms of the Australian mm-hmm. market and creativity. Not in no, definitely not in this space at all. Like I don't think that I've found anyone in Australia doing it. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of the places that I go to are like business of fashion if I want to yes. hear something informative about the industry, but it doesn't particularly relate 100% to us. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, you killed it on your first. Is this your first podcast? Yes. Okay, you killed it. Thank you. Love that. I'm, you were great. You. <laughs> we did great. <laughs> we did it. That brings me to the end of my chat with Zoe. I am so excited to get my copy of Automag in the mail. You need to check out the Made In website too. It is so well done and they just have the best eye. Honestly, it is world class. If you loved this episode, please let me know and you can do so by subscribing to the show. You can leave a review or follow us on Instagram or TikTok. Both are at Process the Podcast or DM me and let me know that you loved it and let's have a chat. See you next week.